Amen. Be seated. Uh, we're thrilled to have you with us at Madison, whether you're a regular member or you're visiting with us. We're honored to have you. The fact that there are other places you could go we're, means so much to me and to those of us who work here and to our shepherds and that you choose to be a part of this body today. It's a good thing. Uh, Wednesday night, a lot of you were with us here. We had uh, the Tennessee School for the Blind. We hosted them, the ch- kids from there, and it was just a great evening. Uh, much of that evening was uh, spent in the, the fellowship hall that's just been restored. Uh, and so it was just a great evening. Very, very thankful. Thank you for all that you've done and all that uh, you care to do to make uh, Christmas season very special for other people besides you and your family. And I'm very appreciative that that's what this church is all about. It's a, it's a good thing and a blessing. Matt, we're glad to have you with us today. Anthony, he's suffering today. He's out there in Hawaii, and uh, it's a tough thing, but somebody has to do that. And so we just really appreciate Anthony Lancaster making that sacrifice to support their economy. I know it's it's Christmas time, and and some of you, when you hear what we're going to be talking about today, are going to go, why are we talking about this today? If I'd known this, I wouldn't be. Let me just say, the next two Sundays are going to be really very focused on Christmas. Next Sunday, uh, the second service, if you want to just do early service and just the regular old sermon thing, that's great. I'll be here. And, but, but the second service that our kids will be on stage and they'll be doing this uh, uh, presentation about Christmas and all that. So our youngest and, and our teenagers and all that. And so it'll be a great service and I hope you'll be there. And uh, then the Christmas Eve at 9 o'clock in the morning, there's going to be one service, 9 o'clock in the morning, lasts about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, a lot of singing, but that's going to be our Christmas gathering that day, so mark that on your calendar because like Wednesday night, we had people show up for my class, I really appreciated them being in my class, but I didn't have a class, so they were kind of disappointed, they were kind of sad looking. So Christmas Eve, 9 o'clock, I want you to be with us and we want this room to be filled and uh, it'll be a great, great morning together. But yes, we're working through the Sermon on the Mount. One of the reasons I work through a book of the Bible is it means I don't get to just pick and choose what I talk about. Instead, the text itself leads me. And so really, this is not really the the text that I'd be kind of going, oh, I'm really very fired up and excited about this text because Jesus is going to be addressing a real hard truth. He's going to be talking about the problem of sexual desire that becomes lust and can become a problem in our lives. And a lot of you kind of go, huh, Merry Christmas. I didn't know I was getting into this this morning. But I think uh, there's a lot to be said. And, and look, it's a very timely topic. And if you've been paying attention to the news, you recognize that sexual desire that becomes lust is a problem in our country. And there's some really powerful men uh, who've been in the news lately because they've not taken Jesus seriously. And, and one of the things I know is there are really kind of two extremes that I think Jesus is helping us to avoid as he talks. One extreme is kind of the one I grew up in, and that is sexual desire in itself is bad. So when I was growing up, I was being, uh, there were a lot of rules that were trying to kind of make sure that you did not experience sexual desire as a teenager. That's kind of a losing battle, but there was very, very strong attempts at do not going mixed swimming. Some call it mixed bathing, but I think that really confused a lot of people. So mixed swimming. (laughs) Now, when we went to Florida, my dad would let us mix swim. I raised that issue one time in the car, and he let me know he'd be glad to enforce that rule down in Florida if I really wanted to. So I just shut my mouth. (laughs) Dancing, uh, we we didn't go to dances because uh, there's a very good chance that your sexual desire would get out of control, given some of the dances we did back in the 60s. So I never learned how to dance. My body just doesn't move with music. That's really a sad thing. But some of you kind of grew up in that tradition. And so we had this one extreme that sexual desire is evil and didn't really take seriously that God created us and these sexual desires are part of his gift, right? But I grew up in the 60s. I was born in the 50s, but I grew up in the 60s. And during the 60s, there was that revolution that said, ah, bah, humbug on that sexual desire is evil. Sex desire is good, and you ought to be expressing yourself and get away from this repression that needs to be expressed, and, and you need to have a good time. And as long as it's consensual, whatever form of sexual, oh, it's good, it ought to be celebrated, it's wonderful. And my, my, problems were created, and we've been reaping the whirlwind of seeds that were sown back in the 60s, haven't we? 
So let me share with you this text from the Sermon on the Mount with Jesus, where he says in Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 30, you've heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you, any man who looks lustfully at a woman has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your eye, right eye, caused you to stumble, pluck it out, gouge it out, and throw it away, it's better to lose a part of your body than to have your whole body thrown into hell or Gehenna. And if your right hand caused you to stumble, cut it off, throw it away. It's better for you to lose a part of your body than for your entire body to, be, to go into hell or Gehenna. It's Matthew 5. 27 through 30. Now, you listen to those words and you kind of go, that just is really old thinking, isn't it? But here's one of the interesting things I find. I don't know about you, but some of us can remember when Jimmy Carter ran for president and he's been interviewed by Playboy and he was asked, had he ever committed adultery? And his response was, well, no, but I have committed adultery in my heart. Now, that statement that was based on the teaching of Jesus because Jimmy Carter was a strong Baptist and he taught a Baptist adult Sunday school class. That statement was made fun of in the media. People thought it was ridiculous. They thought he was silly. They made him look like a fool and an idiot time and late night comedy shows and all that kind of stuff. And what's interesting is there have been some presidents after him who didn't have that view and they didn't mind actually using the power of the office to, well, make sure that their sexual desire was fully expressed. And there was a time when I remember a president when it was kind of going, well, no big deal, no big deal. I, I can remember another president where everybody going, that's a big deal. How could anybody vote for that? Kind? Look, sometimes our cultural views about sex and what's appropriate shift and change and wax and wane and all that. That's why as followers of Jesus, we don't take our lessons from culture. Instead, we turn to Jesus who made us and who understands us and who understands this gift that's been given to us. And he wants us to use it correctly and to enjoy it and to flourish as human beings. The Sermon on the Mount is designed to not only to bless us, but to talk about how our lives can be changed so we can receive the blessings of being in the kingdom of God. We saw last week how he was talking about anger. And this week he's talking about this desire that's a human desire that's a good desire. And let me say, he's moving into uh, the next section, which will be focused on a marriage and divorce, the problem of a divorce, and adultery is brought up there also. And I think what he's doing, I think he has in mind that there are two different views of sex and desire and relationships. Because Jesus is really serious about our loving God with all our heart, mind, and soul, and strength, as well as our neighbors ourselves. Now, in, in our culture, typically the view has been what we might call a consumer model of sexuality. And that is, I've got my need. And you know how consumers do. You have a need. And what you do is you find somebody who can fill that need. You'll pay people with money if necessary, or you'll exchange or whatever with needs. And so the consumer model of sexuality goes, well, I got my need. You got your need. Hey, let's have a relationship. And as long as we're satisfactorily meeting one another's needs, well, that relationship lasts. But... When you no longer are meeting my need, what do I do? I find somebody who can meet my need. I find a new supplier. I find somebody else. And so that relationship ends and a new one begins. That's the consumer model for a relationship as it's based on sexuality. And Jesus is talking about, you'll see that in the next, actually two sections, one on uh, divorce and the other on keeping your word and making promises. His view is that there is a covenant relationship. A relationship that's based on promises made before God and to one another and before witnesses that we call marriage. And it's within that framework that people begin to fully experience what we were designed for. Not only in a sense of bringing forth children, but in a sense of pleasure and fulfillment and, and no shame and no guilt in that relationship received as blessing, as an expression of human flourishing. But Jesus knew there were a lot of people around in his time as well as in our time who might have intellectually known that, but in their lives, something else is going on. And so he has a heart check. What he says is, look what's going on in your heart. We saw that last week. Look what's going on in your heart. Oh, yeah, you hadn't murdered anybody lately. But 
how's that anger working in your heart? How's that bitterness working in your heart? And he's looking at people and going, well, you may not have committed adultery. That's the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. But he seems to be combining that commandment with the tenth commandment, which is about thou shalt not covet that neighbor's wife, that desire for that neighbor's wife, that warning that neighbor's wife, that going, my, my, if I had that neighbor's wife, I'd be happy. Or my, my, if I had that neighbor's husband, ooh, I'd be happy. If I could just exchange it. And Jesus is saying, look, just like murder is an expression of anger that's not dealt with, these adulterous relationships, these, these sexual relationships that damage us grow out of a heart that is looking at someone, not just noticing them, not just noticing they're attractive, but looking at someone differently. And, and the word there that's being used is we're looking at a person as a, an object, not as a person any longer, as an object. We're thinking about the body of that person, and we're thinking about that as, as a, a fulfillment of our gr- own personal gratification. If I could just be with that person for a while, oh my, that would really make me happy. That's what he's dealing with. This desire that's a good desire, but that now is being taken up into the imagination has become the leering look. And, and a lot of you know what I'm talking about. You know the difference between when you see somebody and you notice that, that person is very, very attractive. You just kind of notice that. And when you go beyond just that first notice, instead what you now are doing is you're kind of following that person around because you like, or you're positioning yourself so you can look at that person because what's going on is that person is so desirable to you and all of a sudden there, there's this desire that has now become inflamed and it's not just noticing that person is attractive. There are thoughts in your mind that are this kind of lustful, I've got to have, if I could, if I could get away with it, I'd do something about this. Can't get away with it, but boy, if I could. It's one of the reasons why pornography has become such a, such a problem in our society. Because a lot of people feel like, well, I can get away with it. I can find ways to hide that. I can find ways to keep that secret. And what I can do is I can allow that inflamed lust and that desire to find its full expression, maybe not full expression, but adequate expression, and go, tell myself, nobody got hurt, except for you're not looking at the people who've been exploited in the making of the thing, and you're not paying attention to how it's really beginning to affect you in the way you look at people, and that even though your eyes might not be on a screen, now sometimes when you see a woman or a man, you're thinking things about that person that you ought not to be thinking. There are images in your head that you can't get out. They show up in your dreams. You have allowed the desire to be taken over by your imagination, and you refuse to listen to Jesus, and now it has become a problem. There are people who have addictions to pornography. It's one of the strongest addictions there is. Their marriages have been ruined by pornography. Now, I want to just say this. Jesus says, you know, if you look with that kind of lust at a woman, it's like committing adultery. You've committed adultery. But let's say this. The actual act of adultery is worse because it involves real people, and very often it destroys marriages. It affects the lives of children. It leads to all kinds of problems. But what Jesus is saying is, just like with the anger thing, before it becomes a behavior, are you dealing with the thing that's going on inside your heart? And because nobody can see inside your heart, you're going, oh, this is okay. Jesus is looking at men and women and saying, no, it's not. We've got to begin to deal with this. Look how in our culture, even when, even when that, that kind of lustful desire to become full-blown adultery, full-blown sexual liaison, look at what's going in our culture with the media elite, the politicians, and the corporate world in the last few months, right? If you've been paying attention to the news lately, you recognize that there are people who refuse to listen to Jesus. Instead, they've listened to the culture saying, ah, oh, it's okay, whatever. Oh, well, you know, it's just, it's just an object. And there are these people in power. And what they've done is they've taken advantage of a person who is in a different position. Or what they might have said, well, well you know, we were just kind of playing this game. And I, I really thought she was this. Or I really thought she was that. Or I didn't really realize I crossed the boundary. Well, my, my, I didn't know what was going on. But here... You knew what was going on because the thought in your head was taking you to a place where you did not belong, and then you've acted on it, and now it's become public. Now you've lost that job. Look, 
Do you realize that the Bible has a great story about sexual harassment on the job? Do you know what it is? Let me just say this. It's not the, it's not the, story, that, it's not the story of a man in power taking advantage of a woman. It reverses the role. You don't really think about that too often, do you? But in this story, there's a woman who's in power, and she is trying to take advantage of a man. You know the story I'm talking about now? It's that story of Joseph. He's been sold into slavery by his angry brothers, right? And the man who bought him as a slave has a wife who is kind of really got a little weary of her husband. He doesn't quite look as good as he used to. He's got a little bit older. He's got a little bit fatter. He, he's kind of ignoring her. Who knows? He may be having his relationships with some other woman, all that kind of stuff. And so Potiphar's wife is going, my, my, that Joseph, woo, he looks good. And she kind of keeps inviting him to come to her bedroom. She keeps inviting him to come close and all that because the lust and the desire is going on. And finally, she reaches out and grabs him and he runs and leaves. And what happens? Because he's refused to play the game. Because he's refused to participate. He doesn't just lose his job. What happens to him? He goes to jail. He's punished. He's doing the right thing, but because a person is in power, lies about the thing, is angry about being rejected, is now making sure that he's punished. Just a desire in the heart that's gotten out of control. It has created a problem in the lives of so many people. But then you kind of look at what Jesus says next, and probably you're like me, you kind of go, yikes. Gouge the eye out. Cut the hand off. I've known some people who had been in the blind school and been, we would have, they wouldn't have been able to hold up the food. All right? But look, this, this is what I'm going to say. Look, Jesus, when he's talking about anger, he used exaggeration there. This is what he said. If you've got your gift there in front of the altar, but remember somebody has got something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar and go and be reconciled. Now, when you heard that, you probably didn't think exaggeration, but you weren't using your imagination Let's say I've come from Galilee, no cars. I've come from Galilee to Jerusalem to present my gift. There I got my live animal. I'm going to present as, as an offering, right? And I get there and what Jesus says, he said, leave the animal there in front of the altar. So basically going, can you hold it for just a week? Kind of watch over my animal. I got to get back to Galilee because Jesus said this. Because see, if we take everything Jesus says into a literal law, sometimes we get into real problems. So you rush off to Galilee, you come back. Is that what he's talking about? No, he's saying Take care of this. I think that's what he's talking about with the gouge the eye out. I think that's what he's talking about, cut the hand off. He's saying it's serious. Stop playing around. Start t stop telling yourself it really doesn't matter. Stop listening to what culture says to you. Oh, well, that's just about repression. Ah, well, just people kind of. No, no. Recognize that Jesus is talking about the potential that you might be destroying if you don't right now take responsibility for what's going on inside your heart and your imagination with that leering look, let's deal with this. And so he says, this is serious. Do something about it. And it's, you know, that, that thrown into hell, Gehenna. Gehenna is a place, that's where they burn the trash just outside of Jerusalem, right? There's a fire there. And if you keep a fire in its proper place, fire is good. It's good to get rid of the trash, right? My lovely wife likes it when I get rid of the trash from inside the house to outside the house. But that fire can get out of control and create problems. I think part of the idea there is that there is a desire that is okay and fine, but if you're not careful, that fire in your body gets out of control and it does damage, just like the anger thing gets out of control and does damage. So Jesus is saying, deal with it. Now, maybe what you don't do is you, maybe what you don't do is you don't cut off any body part, but maybe that you cut off some source of media, digital media that you have easy access to. It may be that you choose to end a relationship because you know where that relationship is now and you know where it's going is not where it needs to go. That you say, what well, Jesus is saying to me, I need to be hearing and I need to be dealing with it now. If I need help to deal with it, good, get help. Talk to somebody openly who will keep your confidence, but deal with that thing because that thing will create all kinds of problems in our lives. 
Now, I want to bring all this back to Christmas. I ain't going to go, well, this is going to be good. I'm going to see this. Okay? <laughs> Look at Matthew's genealogy of Jesus. You have Judah and Tamar. That's a story about lust. It gets out of control. But more appropriate is David and the wife of Uriah. He should be out there with the army. He didn't go with the army. But instead, one night, he's looking, and he sees her bathing, and he likes what he sees. See that? Look, not just noticing, going, oh, my, I don't need to be, I don't need to get my binoculars out here. I need to go back inside. Instead, he invites her to come over. He's the king. She comes over. Now, she's also wife of one of the 30 men, Uriah. You go to the end of 2 Samuel, Uriah is one of David's faithful soldiers. And what he does is his lust becomes adultery, becomes sexual relationship with this woman, and she becomes pregnant. And now David not only has done that, but now he is getting ready to be deceptive. He brings Uriah in. Uriah is so faithful to David, he won't go home to be with his wife Bathsheba. David becomes angry because Uriah is not cooperating. He has Uriah set up. His anger becomes murderous intent. He has Uriah killed. And he thinks it's all covered up until Nathan the prophet addresses him and tells him a story and goes, you're the man. Look, Desire is not a problem. I desire food. To desire sex, not a problem. But just like my desire for food can get out of control and I begin to gain weight and I can do damage to myself and I become gluttonous and it becomes just a major problem in my life and the life of my family, so can sexual desire, if we don't deal with it, create problems in our homes, create problems in our work, create problems in our country. I think it's also interesting, look at Joseph, not Joseph in the Old Testament, Joseph at the end of the genealogy of Jesus, he discovers Mary's pregnant. How does he make sense of it? He makes a judgment about her. He decides that she has had lust and has not controlled it, and she's become pregnant. You see, very often, lust in a person's heart leads to judgment of other people. You can see that with the Pharisees, for example, in Luke chapter 7. The prostitute is there, anointing, weeping over Jesus' feet, washing them and all that. And the, those guys kind of jump, well, if he knew what kind of woman she is, because we know what kind of woman she is. If he knew what kind of woman she is, why, he wouldn't have anything to do with her. And Jesus is not looking at her as a sexual object. He's looking at her as a person to be loved, to be forgiven, to be cared for, and to have peace because she's been so abused and used by men all of her life. And now she's come upon a man who treats her differently. And Joseph has a judgment about Mary, but the angel makes it clear to Joseph that your, your assumption is wrong. This is God's work. And so what does he do? I want you to pay attention to this. He takes her as his, and for the rest of their lives, they're going to be people who do not understand the thing. They're going to look at what they saw. They're not going to understand what God has been up to and doing. They're going to see this baby and this man and woman, basically the, the template, they're going to have the judgment in that religious community, that shame-based community. The judgment is going to be, oh, they couldn't control their lust. They got out of control. And that Jesus baby, well, he, you know, he, he, he was not, he was born before they got married. This is not good. This is, that's what they're going to live with. But because they were in the center of God's will, it didn't matter what anybody else thought about them. They were going to be true and faithful to God. Look, if you begin to obey Jesus, there may be some people who go, well, you're just so repressed. You're just, you, if you are obeying Jesus, you can do that with confidence. And you can understand this, just like a person who's a great gardener might, might prune a rose bush so that more beautiful blooms come out, take away healthy buds so that more blooms come out. So you are tending the desires of your heart so that you are more capable of really receiving the blessings of the kingdom of God come near in your heart, in your life. And this is the thing, that baby who's born to Joseph and Mary, when he becomes a full-grown man, he's going to know temptation. He's going to know what desire is, and he's going to deal with that temptation. He's not asking us to do something that he didn't do. And he's even going to die on a cross so that all my sins, the sins of my heart and the sins that have become actions in the world can be forgiven. 
And he's going to teach me a different way to think about everything. And he's going to invite me to follow him, begin to practice what he's teaching. And not only that, because of what he's done on the cross, not only will he give me forgiveness of sin, not only will he provide teaching, but he will say, and I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit who will begin to work in your life and create in you, reform you spiritually. Because all of us have been formed spiritually. But when we come under the discipleship of Jesus, we are reformed by him spiritually. Things are changed. We hear what he says, do what he asks us to do, and do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Change begins to happen. And what he says is, you're struggling? This is hard for you? Well, yeah. Okay, it's hard for you. You bring that to me, Jesus, and let's get in the yoke together, and I will help you carry the burden, and you won't find it so heavy. If you're really serious about doing this and it's your intention to change, there will be the means and there will be the people. If your desire is to follow Jesus and to obey him, he will be with us and help us. I believe that. I've known other people who have followed that. Now, some have had to go into programs of accountability and other kinds of things. Good. That's how serious they were to deal with this problem. Well, you've been patient. I've run over a minute. This morning, I want us to get ready to stand here because, look, if you need prayer this morning about something, might not have anything to do with the sermon, that, that's fine. Uh, Jim will meet you with you back in the back, uh, just outside those doors, and, and pray with us. Uh, if there's something that you need to share with the group, uh, there may be somebody who's decided to follow Jesus and wants to make that confession and, and begin that life with Jesus as a disciple this morning. But that's why we're going to stand together and sing as an opportunity to make that known to the body. Let's stand together.